got the bell. All right. Welcome, everyone. This is the first seminar of our seminar series. Uh, I want to thank, first of all, uh, Rick Stars Lab for baking pizza for us today, <laughs> sort of. And um, uh, well, I'd like to introduce Patricia Eichler. She's actually a postdoc in my lab. She started uh, last fall, so it's been when in March. That's winter then. See, I get confused. Uh, she's here for one year, so we're going to see her around for a few more months. Uh, so let me tell you how I met Patricia. So Patricia sailed with me on an uh, ocean drilling program cruise to the Western Pacific uh, two years ago, and she sailed as a micropaleontologist. So you know, you'll see here that she's uh, introducing herself as biological oceanographer, but actually she also works as a micropaleontologist. In particular, she's looking at benthic for anifers uh, to both uh, uh, date, course, sediment course, but also reconstruct their depositional environment and, and uh, oceanographic conditions. But as you see there, she's a biological oceanographer interested on the assessment of coastal and marine environments through the use of benthic marine forums and uh, their geochemical characteristics. But she's worked on very different things, including uh, uh, environmental uh, projects, water quality, ecology and evolution of ecosystem, marine ecology, sedimentology, biodiversity, conservation of marine environments and marine biodiversity. So right now she's a professor at the Environmental Science postgraduate program at the, at the Sul de Santa Catarina University, University, Unisul, and also she has a dual appointment at the Geodynamic and Geophysics postgraduate program in the Federal do Rio Grande do Norte University. She obtained her PhD in 2001 um, at the Oceanographic Institute of Sao Paulo in Brazil. So it's my pleasure to introduce her. And uh, one other thing is that you'll see me zipping out 15 minutes before the end of the talk. I have to give a talk in Pacific Grove. The quiz starts at 5.30, so I apologize if you see me running away. It's not that I don't like her talk. <laughs> All right, thank you. So, hello, good afternoon. So it's a pleasure for me to be here uh, today and talk about um, the environment assessment coastal areas. Uh, in Brazil. So as Ivano already told you, uh, I came from Brazil so and to university. And here as I have, uh, I am a postdoc at his lab. And also I am uh, at UCSC doing some marine uh, stable isotopes with Ca uh, Cristina Ravello. And I work with uh, foraminifera. And what is foraminifera? They are uh, microorganisms. They have one cell, right? So and they can tell everything about the environment of the present and of the past, right? So today I'm going to talk uh, why and how we work on, with them. I'm going to show you. Um, I'm going to show some different coastal areas in Brazil. Um, and the third part, I'm going to be talking about uh, case studies. Uh, one is the water masses interaction in the, in the continental shelf of Brazil. Uh, our oil spill in Rio de Janeiro, and coral reefs that then up north, northeastern part in Brazil, and the Western Pacific warm pool. I have some data that we I have been work with uh, Professor Aiello and uh, Professor Ravello. So why do we work with foraminifera like that? Because fossils like this tiny foraminifera they can give you clues about past climate. So. There was in New York Times, I, I think it was very interesting. And then it's, it's a New York Times thing, so we better study, right? There's like, oh, we are sure, of. I've been doing this for the last 25 years. I have eight postdocs, so if you don't get a job, like think about me trying to get a job. And you know what? I have a postdoc. Oh, good. That's good, good, good. So it's eight, right? OK. And why do you keep doing this? Because they are easy to collect, not expensive. They have a statistic great value, and the shells are preserved after their death. And the time average that we can get out of them, it's like if you look at the living fauna, you get a snapshot of the environmental condition. But you can look at the total fauna, and then you have an average picture of the ecological condition for like 
or the last year or even the last 23 million years ago. So, and I'm gonna show you. Um, another thing, why we study the sediment? Because most of the pollutants, they settle down in the sediment, so it's the best place to look at them. So there is also the distinguish between the or, no, no anthropogenic, like the natural, and an, the anthropogenic. Like, so we, you can tell like there is a, a anthropogenic disturbances and the natural. So that's the difference that's very subtle and they can tell. So I'm gonna show you that too. So, and so they are very useful indicators of ecological health and recent coastal environments. So that's why I've been looking at them like the recent and I'm gonna show you a lot. But, so, but everybody else study them by looking at the climate. So they, they look into geology time and they look at cool and temperature or warm water species that are preserved at the, mom, at the time that the creature was living. So you know that they were living there because they cannot move, right? They, they, are, they are stay there and if you get a sample, oh, that's supposed to be an uh, ocean or environment uh, or a fresh water because you can tell that they preserve their carbon, ca calcium carbonate. So that's where you can, there are microfossils. So by looking at them, you can have the age of rocks, for example, even to 500 million years ago, or, and then we look at to interpret changes in sea level, right? So the specific species, they, they can tell you exactly where they're coming from, right? So, and how do you, do you look at them? So you have this dynamical population living over here, like in the, in the different, like in the estuary. So you have a lot of variables, right? So each environment has particular sediment and like the hydrographic property that you look for. And then they will affect the dynamics. So that's what we look at. I look at the ecological aspects of the population dynamics, right? So we just can use like big, big vessels or small vessels, or even we can have small things to collect, or we, we use like divers when you need like to, I don't dive, right? So I just send people to dive. Um, it's interesting, but I use equipment, so it goes to, the, it's a web sample, so everybody knows from the geology. So I just use that, and I work with the very first centimeter of the sediment, right? So uh, we just can tell, oh, it's the last year. So, and we just put them in vials like this, and we measure the properties that we have, like the probes available, like maybe nutrients and oxygen. Um, so we go to the laboratory, that's the worst part ever, right? Because you wash them and you think, oh, we're done, no, and then you put them all together and then you glue them and then you name them, right? And then you're crazy because each of them is one of these. And then people say, oh, you're not done yet. I said, no, I'm gonna take two more weeks because you know, it's 65 of them. Right, yeah, it's a lot of work on the sterile microscope, but it, it's very nice when you, you, ha you have a setting of what's going on, like 100 um, species, for example, and then you know how oh, this is going, and then you, try, you, you start to understand that's when it, everything comes together in your mind, and so I'm gonna show you, okay, and how we do that. After we have that, that set of data, we just have that look at the absolute density and also the re relative. And we do some analysis, you know, diversity, dominance, and even it, everything that everybody does, like biological stuff. And then you try to correlate, like do multivariate analysis, um, multidimensional scaling or principal component analysis to try to understand what's going on because it's so many micro species and so small, right? Uh, but then you you try to try first to analyze spatial first, and I'm gonna that's what I'm gonna try to show you by looking at the different environments that we've been looking at in Brazil, right? So the study areas come from the south. Of, today I live in this place. Okay, I did my Brazil is a big country, 
So I did my PhD here in Sao Paulo, and then I went to Laguna first postdoc, and then I went to US for five years, two or three postdocs right there, and then came back to this part, studied the coral reefs, right? So I am back to the island. And so we've been around, and I'm gonna show you data first in the Laguna, there was the first postdoc ever, so we did, this is a hyposaline choked lagoon, and there is, they have a lot of problems like hog farms, domestic sewage, and we couldn't understand like this, this environment by looking at the, the population. So the salinity ranges from two to 30. So it's very interesting because here you can see a graduate of salinity that that's the, the fauna shows, right? So you have like the high diversity marine fauna in this part and then it, it, get, it go into up when there is like just fresh water input and then you get to a fresh water related fauna where it's the hypoxia and, and I work at a lot of um, renewable environment. So that would be a place that would have a lot of renewable uh, waters and that can tell by just looking at the foraminifera. So next one like some bays that we have been looking. Um, the base, the problem is also is the domestic sewage and re petroleum refineries. Uh, there's Todos os Santos in Bahia and São Paulo and São Sebastião, right? But one thing that we understand that even if bays are more open oceans and supposed to be like higher diversity compared to a choked lagoon that is like a fresh water environment, that's not happening just because we have so much um, uh, polluted and then it's, restrain, uh, it's restricting like the diversity. And we can get like a low diversity fauna, but at least we have four dominant species were alive close to the sewage. So, and there's one of species that, that are partially dissolved. So we can actually see the ones who are dying or the ones who likes it, good. So. Some of them like it, so we're gonna show how they, they are preserved, right? So how we can show, okay. So if you have close to the sewage input, you got these four species that uh, they increase in abundance and they will consume a lot of organic matter, right? And you, they are hypoxia tolerant. And close to the refi refineries, you have a decrease of this abun abundance, but that's not a, a um, Decrease. It's just because it's the last species to disappear, because it's her, its test is a little bit thicker, so it, it can tolerate a little bit more the acidification of the environment of the sediment that we already seen there in Brazil. So, just for the, the third part about the case study, so the first one is the oil spill, and it's it happened in Rio de Janeiro in 2000. Three, I guess, let me see. So there was a, this leak of the oil crude in Guarabara Bay, and we went there to try to understand. It's a beautiful picture, doesn't it? All right, so how do, does oil affect the marine environment? How? So the breakdown of the oil components in water liberates hydrogen sulfide, ammonia, and methane. So it reduce, reduces the sediment pH and the dissolved oxygen in the water, right? So it's gonna have an if effect in the foraminifera because they're made, uh, made of cal calcium carbonate. So that, just a background in the area, uh, uh, this is spilled like 1.3 million liters uh, of oil, crude oil in this part over here. So it was in 2000, right? So this is Guanabara Bay and this is the only open source to the ocean, right? A curiosity, this is Rio de Janeiro, the war, like the, the biggest, uh, largest city in Brazil, right? And this is Niterói, maybe the second one. And all the sewage of both cities, they all dumped over here, right? So it's not even inside the bay, but not outside. And then we're gonna see what's going on. But we didn't to see the dumping of sewage. We went to see the oil, right? The accident, let's concentrate, right? So what, what was to evaluate there? It was to, to, to see the biological indicators. We look at the foraminiferous species 
and we got salinity, sediment, pH, and soft oxygen in the water. And we went there not right after, because it took us six months to get organized. So six months after the spill, and then one year later, right? So I, I will show you. Um, the samples were done 26, so we took the boat over here. Um, this is the, the oil spill. So six months after the spill and one year. This is a kind of the beautiful houses that we have there. Like they are slums, right? So everybody, there's no way for anybody to control anything. So everything's dumped over here. So what we are seeing over here, it's here, right? So it's a lot of things. Um, so just going to the results, the salinity, so winter and summer, right? Bottom salinity. You can see that in winter, there is a lot of marine water penetration up here. You got to like the isoline for 34. But then during fresh water time, that's our summer, there is a fresh water influence that you, you see like 34 is up over here. So the bay is supposed to be like one communication with the ocean just go up over here and it goes and goes away, right? Uh, we knew in the water. But it doesn't happen any, it doesn't happen anymore. Why? Because this is like a, a drug dealer traffic over here. So nobody can do anything. It's a lot of sewage. So um, it's all dumped. Uh, so what the marine water does is go here and come back right now. Okay? Uh, by saying that, let's see, the pH after six months after the incident, there was like 0 0.8 we, we could find. And look, one year is supposed to be good the environment because there is not a lot of acidification anymore. Looks like the environment has recuperated because of fresh water and things. But let's see the fauna. So this, oh, no, this is, oh, sorry, oxygen first. So oxygen, winter and summer. So there is a low oxygen due to the oil we spill. This is, bo this is for the oxygen, uh, the surface. You can see a little bit in the surface. But in the bottom, you see like the hypoxia, the seasonal hypoxia over here in December, it's so bad. And it actually, it doesn't mean anything about the incident itself. And we, we start seeing something about the sewage and not kind of the, the oil spill that we were looking for, right? So this is the marine indicator fauna. So showing like precisely like that's the signature on the bottom, the sediment for the winter and in the summer, you see the penetration is over here because of the fresh water, you know, all the mangrove area we have here. I didn't mention, but all mangrove areas surrounded by slams and you know, a lot of uh, very poor neighborhoods. So you can see that doing the, Summer, there is a little bit still there, right? So showing the salinity influence there. Okay, and this is ammonia showing the fresh water influence. Look, so in winter and summer, that's nice. But looks like one year later that the PAD was supposed to be good, we have something like a berry zone from this species. Why? Because it's a little bit thinner. In so it was dissolving and so even one year and this one you can see that six months there is a, a it's a relative uh, it's a relative abundance so in one year that the relative absent in, uh, sorry the relative abundance increased but increased not it was just because the ab absence of the other one Right? So this is the last one to disappear, actually. And this is Bulimineli elegantissima. It's uh, one that she likes uh, anoxia zones. So, her, uh, so during the winter, 
the, uh, the sewage is over here, but that in the summer, you have like, it follows the anoxia zone. So that's I very interesting that we could see by just going to see the oil, uh, we actually ended up looking at the um, sewage problem, right? So, and then we, we, we can actually do a kind of map trying to show like the little areas, like the freshwater influences, the barren zone that was created by the oil spill. And this is the, the worst part of the organic matter accumulation that it's from the sewage, actually. That's worse than the everyday contamination that's going on over here. And not that, of course, the accident happened in an environment that was totally degraded by then. But we, are, we still see that there is uh, a lot of problems going on because of the bearing zone. Even one year later, right, then the marine uh, influence, we can see that it's still going on, but it's just at the beginning of the, like the entrance of the, the area. And so, okay, um, this is that my second case, there are four of them, and I don't think I'm gonna bother you too much, but the, so this is, uh, there was a work done in this coastal area, like this. Is it? Ah, oh, it is my baby girl's phone. I told them, don't leave it here because, okay. Okay, so, but they, and they left the room, you know? Okay, so fresh water influence and water masses interaction along the so southwest Atlantic continental shelf. So we did some transects over here. Oh, and what's going on? This is um, a river, a big river, so La Plata River. And it's from Argentina and Uruguay. And the, the thing is that the big river from Argentina is dumping a lot of things there too. And we know that the current, it's up north. So it goes to Brazil, all the things that the Argentinian, they're doing on the south. And I'm gonna show you how we know that. So this is the map about the um, subtropical shelf water. That is a Brazil current and the warm part, right? And there is um, the south current, the Mal Malvinas. And in like this, it's the subantarctic shelf water. So when these two water masses meet, you have a front. So and the subtropical shelf front. And I'm gonna talk about this or the work that we did. So what we went to look at the influence of freshwater runoff from Plata River, that's a river in Argentina, right? And the water mass interaction on the latitudinal distribution of the benthic foraminifer, right? So we did um, 11 transects, so winter and summer. I do basically my works kind of looking what's going on, freshwater and um, not freshwater season, so dry season, okay. And, and there were 11 transects. Um, so it's all sediment samples and a lot of um, hydrographic um, properties that we look at. So I'm showing you first the results from winter and summer too. So I just changed like the, the map, you see? It's just like this. So Rio de La Plata is over here. And you see like the coastal water in this part, and you can see also that the summer, shh, your cell phone was playing over here, shh. Okay, so salinity and temperature and oxygen. You see that the like, temperature, there is like a front in the winter, this is a front between the cold water mass and the warm water, okay? And during the summer, you can see that the, pen, the warm water penetration just go up here. So the front is dislocated a little south, okay? And the oxygen follows the same pattern, right? And here it's interesting because the, the water from, the uh, fresh water from the river goes up to like maybe 200, maybe 700 kilometers this part. Right? So we, we could see that there is varia seasonal variation alone, right? 
So what about the biological, the foraminifer? We also have this Buchella likes cold water. So, it, but it, during the summer, we can see that there is uh, the limitation and there's the warm water penetrating over here. That's gonna show a little bit more for this one, too. So, can you see that in summer, the, the, the warm current penetrates until up here by looking at this two, and winter it wasn't there. So, this summer the current is very strong. It gets up down to south of Rio de la Plata. And then in the winter it has, um, it is strong enough to get up to, and then there is an the indication for the organism. So, and one thing about working with a lot of like 100 species is when you, you have one that tells you something like a strong influence of the subtropical shelf front, like even in winter and in summer, there is the same thing that it's easier to show what's going on and it's easy to publish just one species. So it takes like seven years to publish one 100. But when you have one, that's something, it takes you six months. Right, that's very interesting for you too, because sometimes they show you and you just have to try to understand the sign, right? So this is, it's not so changing. Okay, so um, just like a summary, uh, 1980, both was quite by looking at foraminifer, he could basically map a little bit what's going on, but then 2008, the oceanographer, they, they were able to do all this, like the you know, hydrographic, oh my God, balance. Here. So, and then we just mapped, the, we put our foraminifers there, look, they're here. One, two, and three. So, the, from the warm water and from the cold and from the, like, in between, right? So, this is the coral reef. It's another from the northern eastern part of Brazil, right? So, we look at them to see if we could observe the same thing on the coral reef. Is it possible for foraminifer to be used as health uh, indicators? And then we look at, try to look at the global change in acidification. Right? And we look at two, this is some nice water feed. So we look at two different um, coral reef area. One is, you can see it's, you can see it's sub, and the other one it's submerged. So uh, what's the, and then we, we took like some spatial, spatial sand, sediment, and also some cores, small ones. And just one the beautiful picture from one that you cannot see. This, this is the one that you can see, the submerged one, you cannot see. And just by looking at this data, you can see that there is no one, no area here that is indicative of a good, uh, conducive to, to reef growth. And this one, you can see a little bit more of the brown that's higher. That's just mean difference between two different coral reefs. One, that you don't have anything, um, like you don't have a health environment, is when you can actually dive and step, step on them. And the other one who's a little deep, deep, you cannot step, you just like the divers just go and don't step on them. So you have a better uh, response of the community if the divers don't touch it. So you were a, we were able to see that and we just are trying to publish a paper about that. So divers, just be careful. And another thing, just by looking at a very simple uh, core for the last 25 years or so, because they are like 25 centimeters as kind of, uh, centimeter for a year because it's very, um, the sediment rate is very high. 
So for the last 25 years, we can see that there is a small decrease in diversity. So here is like 25 years ago, and now it's today. So there is a little bit. We are still looking at a lot of data, but we can say a, a lot of things about. OK, and that's um, the new the newly uh, discovered uh, reef area. Oh, Brazil, there is a, uh, reef areas that are not discovered. Yes, 2015, we found one. So actually, the Brazil coast, it's all coral reefs, and we didn't know about until 2015. And now we're trying to, to map them. So we, that's one, uh, one of the things I'm, I'm, I'm looking at. We are looking at possibly uh, upwelling features um, exactly kind of the same uh, features you guys we have here at Monterey Bay uh, but and we're not we're trying to see so there is some upwelling areas that we are trying to look at this about this cold water indicator that I, I told you before and that's the last thing I'm talking about is the okay that we, we say together me and Dr. Aiello and I have some just a new explanation about that and a little data that's just recently. So that we, we did in 2016, we got nine cores out of this area and it's very warm. This is the one of the, is the, warm, the warmest place um, of the Pacific Ocean. So, right, okay. And we are studying this, this period over here, Neogen and the quaterna Quaternary, right? So, something going on on, on the ship, so we do a lot of cores, and by looking at these species, okay, this is a picture for Dr. Aiello that I really like it, because it shows like the nine sediment cores that were taken out, and one of the best ones to study is this two, but actually, um, and they, and they recorded uh, uh, the 23 last million years ago, and out of that, we tried to look at the sensitivity of the benthic foraminifera, right? So to paleo-environmental changes, because for until now, um, I was talking about today what I, uh, we can see the water masses, right? So this is the something that I'm looking at. So this guy, Lutzin, he did this warm, warm benthic foraminifer curve when he got like a balance of warm and cool water species. And also by looking at deep water and shallow water species, we can as I, as I told you, just one species is something, is supposed to be telling something now. So we are going to look at this very, very important, specific one, because uh, it, it says that is an indicator of surface water productivity. So it thrives in high nutrient condition that we will try to reconstruct the evol evolution of this monsoon via the seasonality, right? Uh, and appears to have this one species has to have good correlation with the warm curve. And in, in many points that we, in some of the course, so these are some of the cores, then we're trying to observe what we might uh, going on. And it's interesting because um, uh, we will be, there's a lot of things that we can see now that, for example, uh, we had um, in five of the nine cores that we got out, um, five of them show that uh, 23 million years ago war was actually warmer than today, right? So our data sh shows, like the sediment shows that we're going to to a uh, less warm period, right? But I don't know about the last 100 years yet. That's what we, we are have to look at. But by our data, 
like it's it's actually cooling now so that's what the balance and i have some other that I, i'm not showing now but if anybody want to say something about that because somebody i, I told somebody and, and then they oh maybe you're picking up the sign of from the melting of the glaciers because what i what i can see my i see more cold water species now than before right so it is a question for you guys because i can i don't understand very well actually and but then actually we think that uh this this uvi gerina follows this increases in at least two of the the cores and then we can also say that they support a quali qualitative at least a qualitative trace of water masses because since i work with core catchers and we have like from 10,000 years to 500,000 years of difference in the data it's a lot of things to work in between right so it's a lot of things to understand i think that's everything that i had to say and this is my email if anybody wants to send me an email or talk about that and be my guest in brazil too when i go back that february 2019 i have two universe for everybody to go and collaborate with all these errors i showed you guys okay thank you are used as environmental health indicators. Like it was really clear how they shaped out with different water temperatures and identifying masses that way. But your example with the oil spill in the lagoon, um, like what variables kind of act as health indicators of the water? It's uh, ox oxygen. Uh -huh. the, the, the water is the same, the, the variables in the, or the foraminifera. Oh, you're saying that they're because I look at the, yeah. the 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 population dynamic. What I look, I look at like the opportunities. I look at which one dominates, which one what's what's the diversity is, is higher, and what's the diversity supposed to be, if uh, if uh, you you had a clean environment. But I look at the all the nitrate, nitrogen, like phosphates, and as much as variable you can get, the better. Even from the like, even like grains, percentage of um, size grains, I look at that too. Mm -hmm. oh, organic matter, all the variables. Uh, the bay next to Rio de Janeiro, yeah. uh, I was curious of what, how long the residence time was for water um, to reside in there, and two, is that Rio's what I understand is known for their beaches. Um, it's very popular, and I was wondering how safe that water was to swim in. There's all the sewage and oil spills and, and everything. Okay, okay, <laughs> you know what? When they said, oh, we're gonna do the Olympics. They did the Olympics. In what, when was it? 2012, I guess? Mm -hmm. I was like, oh my God, in 2000, they had, like that pollution, I'm gonna tell you something about one sample that I was doing in, in one area that I told you, like, uh, you're not supposed to be there because there was a, a war. Actually, we sent like the, the sediment sample and hair came out. <laughs> like hair, I was like, hair, how come? Let's say another one. The guy said, no, Patricia, let's move. <laughs> <laughs> Body drop. Burr. I was like, what? Yeah, like there is a war. Maybe they drop bodies here. I said, oh, okay, let's go. No, it's very bad, very bad. So I don't know how people can. Do. Okay, there is from Mango Beach. That's all inside the bay. Good ones to go. That outside the bay, you go like to Copacabana. It's a good one. 
but don't go by yourself ever. Don't speak English ever. Nobody, you just like go. If you have a Brazilian, you go because they're gonna look at you unfortunately and say, oh, they have dollars. And they will try to take you. So don't go to Rio by yourself. You got to get in contact with somebody who lives there. I live in the nice island and I don't go to Rio ever. Yes, I went there 2001, 2001 never again. And it's very hot. Florianópolis is the island, the south, that it's Rio de Janeiro in the 60s. So might you wanna go there? <laughs> yeah, no, it's bad. It's really bad. And the residence times that you asked before, I wanna guess, but it's like, I read somewhere, but it's like, eight days something, eight and a half, but I, I can get that to it, but it doesn't, it doesn't do all the flushing. It just go up and down to the bay, it doesn't. Yes, and it's very clear when you get the sediment. It's interesting, yeah. Anybody else, any curious, curiosity? Okay. Well, in the sediment, what would be a typical uh, uh, numeric Concentration is there? A, do you do it on a per um, yeah I try, I, centimeter basis? Yeah, or? yeah. It's like by um, cubic centimeter, or I just count one hundred. But in a cubic and centimeter, like, are there um, uh, ah, like thousands? Yeah, maybe five thousand, maybe. Yeah, so we, we estimate. We estimate. And did, did the our radiolarians? There's a lot of radiolarians, then like the foraminifer and then the radiolarians is very small for us. Uh -huh. Yeah, they're very small, but they are some of them, yes. But yes. Uh, it's dominated uh, by foraminifer. Yes, and because the sieve we will use, we got the 63 micrograms, so look at higher than that, yeah. Um, you looked at the Malvinas current area in the present day, can that work now be used to look at where the Malvinas current has been in past finances. Oh yeah, that would be great to do on the course that right there, yes. The yes. It's interesting you yeah. can do that. Yeah. And are are they better preserved in some sediments compared to others? Can you do this anywhere? Or um, Yeah they're they're, they're pretty much very well preserved in the silt and clay and it's mostly what you get. It's when we have a lot of sandy sediments that you have a little less preservation, but actually we always have a lot of preservation. We have like maybe eight, more than 80% of preservation in the ship. Yeah, it's very, it's very cool. It's pretty unusual. It's pretty unusual. I mean, it was? Just, yeah, they were perfect. Yeah, they're perfect. I mean, the exactly. stuff was like five million years old and it was like yesterday. Yeah, yeah. shiny. Shiny, yeah. yeah. <laughs> exactly. All right, anybody else?